languages that are found in Portuguese today. Now, it's actually really cool, isn't it, to think that in just one little tiny example of this chapter one on the introduction to the study of Portuguese linguistics, we have all of these resources we drew from, which started us off in this really creative way of looking at something as diverse as Papiamento Creole language on one end, and how many Portuguese language speakers there are in the whole world. And then the students choose what they want to do with that, and now they have an opportunity to build their own portfolio. And now we have this variety of things that goes from a study of Portuguese orthography between Brazil and Portugal on one end, and Gallego Portuguese on the other, and words of African origin that are used in Portuguese today. We kind of said earlier, it's not what we do, it's what the students do that ends up in learning. A student who is forced to read chapter five and answer the questions into the chapter, I mean, you don't want to be forced to do anything. Your initial reaction every time we're forced to do something, even if it's a good thing, is to not do it. Because we don't want to be forced. But the second you have a little bit of choice about what you're going to do, all of a sudden you find out, man, these people find really great things. And you know, it becomes a game as the semester goes on. Sometimes we go, this is such an awesome site, we're putting it on my page. You know, and we'll, we'll like make a copy of it on the major page, too, along the way. The other thing that happens here is then now we have opportunities where students get to share with other students what is on the walls. And so we've gone from just a one direction, me as the professor, giving things to students this way. Now we've changed the direction by having the students provide for us what it is they want to do with all these sort of things. And in the third phase, we now have students sharing with students things they've discovered along the way, going, oh, I found the greatest movie ever. Oh, I found the greatest article ever. I found the greatest picture ever. And so notice that this takes us right back to the major premise we started with, which is whatever we do in society to communicate back and forth and to share information, let's just take a little piece of that and figure out how that applies to our situation with our students who are learning. And notice, and this we talked about on Tuesday as well, when we met the other group, which is Padlet is not created for language learning purposes. But it's made for people communicating back and forth purposes. We just happen to do it all in Portuguese on this side. And you get to do it in French or in English or in Spanish or whatever language that it is that you're teaching because that just becomes part of the world that way. So I really, I think it's a really powerful tool to have that sort of thing along the way. And um, let me just show you just, just a couple more quickly as we go through this. So, so that was uh, his chapter one. Chapter two, this is the one on sounds. Um, he chose to do a thing on palatalization. Uh, for those of you who aren't into fancy schmancy linguistic terms, that's when in English, you don't know if you're going to say, what are you or whatcha? Mm -hmm. yeah. Whatcha doing? That's the cha cha. When, a, when it becomes a cha sound, that's palatalization. And poor old Portuguese struggles with a million examples of that. By the way, in French, mm -hmm. the word for you is not tu, it's tu, right? Like almost like a ch high <laughs> aspiration. Yeah. Tu, 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 tu. And also, if I wanted to say soul, it's not then do, it's then do, do. It's almost like it's almost a two. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm working on my French here. He's doing awesome. And so, so anyway, this student is interested enough in that whole idea of palatalization. He goes, I'm going to look at more of that. Can you imagine if I had assigned 30 students go and study palatalization? They all would have gone, I don't want to do that. But I have a student who is interested enough in Portuguese sounds and dialects. He's going, I'm going to look this up. Why do the Portuguese say dia and the Brazilians say gia? That's weird. We're going to figure this baby out. And so instead of becoming a boring assignment for 30 people, it has now become the focus 
of one student or something they want to do. So this right here, the way you have it, it's just them, you say, go find four things, put it on the thing. Is there any interaction, like back when you had the ratings and the comments, do they, other students see these as well and interact with this or no? Okay, the answer to that question is we have a day set aside as part of our activities in class where students will share their walls with others. And so they do have a chance to say, yeah, I posted these four things and the best one is this one, let me show it to you. So we kind of do that exchange in class. I have not actually incorporated the comments and ratings into what I'm doing yet with students, and I probably will down the road. The, the truth is that the comments feature is new to Padlet. They didn't have that until like six months ago. So I haven't actually done that way. But students can see each other's posts. Oh, totally, right. yeah. And again, it's the same thing where, where depending on your situation, if you're in a high school with with 15 years old, and you have to be more concerned about you know, what gets out publicly, then the private settings and the controlled settings will be more appropriate for your group. This one we've made secret, but still, that if you have the URL, you can get to it. And, and we also tell the students specifically that you know, this is the sort of thing that the whole world could see. And so don't put anything that you don't want the whole world to see that way. And then what I do, as you saw, I made a one-page thing with links to all of the student Padlet walls so that everybody in class in one click can get to it. So that's what that's anything about that you want to show us, like how you did it, or anything complex about it, or no? No, there's nothing complex about it. Um, it is just simply, you, you saw the wall. Let's, let's actually do it for you here. So we have a demo workshop. And we're going to uh, click twice, and I'm going to call this link to stuff. Okay. And I'm going to get a, a page here. This is my cross cultural. So let me copy that page. Go back to my demo one. And here's where it says link. So I'm going to copy that baby in there. So I'm going to copy this because it's that easy. <laughs> copy it in there, hit save, and boom, there it is right there. And now when I click on it, I go right to that page. And so that, it's just a matter of making a, making a link that way. Oh, and by the way, that was so good, I'm going to rate that. And you did that for each of your students. That was fine. Way to go. And, and you can also put it within the text that way, too, and have multiple links inside the same document. So whatever links you have in something work within this as well. Okay, so, so you, you saw the basic idea, which is I've taken something that in society we use anyway and said, hey, I can use that in a pedagog for a pedagogical purpose, and I know in my case there are a million things we add to our class every semester. I'm just going to get them all ready now and throw them in there. And, and you know what it's like? It's like the next semester you go, wow, oh, I found that great site last semester. Where was it? Well, now I know where it is because I put it on my wall. And, and I can just like transfer it all over the next time around. And so, so then we have the students do the same thing. It gives them the freedom and flexibility they want to do. We do it all in our own language, and we have them shared among themselves as well. I mean, this to me is a very good example of then versus, versus now. What can I do that I couldn't do 10 years ago? I couldn't do this 10 years ago. I simply would not be able to approach language learning in that sort of way. Now I can. And for me to put it over on the students, allow them the flexibility to find the pieces they want to find and stuff they like, for me is gold, you know, to have them have that kind of flexibility. Okay, so let me just, uh, for the couple minutes that I have left here, let me just show you two other sites. 
Um, so now, let's go through this one again. Um, ideas using technology, and it should make a little bit more sense now, which is, uh, I've made this wall where uh, I taught a graduate course a few semesters ago on using technology, and so I just threw that syllabus up on the wall. Here's my YouTube channel, here's my Twitter feed, here's my homepage, here's my Facebook group, here's our Conversa Brasileira movies, here's our Lingua de Gente podcast. I know it makes it sound like about me, but it just makes it good to have everybody have access to our stuff that way. Um, here I have little classic cool video clips about technology. You know, so this has always been one of my favorites right here. This is the... Uh, Well, that's not good. <laughs> oh, I need this. I'm already late. Anybody have that? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! <laughs> Hello! There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? Help! 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 <laughs> I don't believe this. You got it. Anyway, we'll let you see how it ends another day. <laughs> but do they get off the escalator? That's what we want to know. So it's a great video clip about what happens when technology doesn't work. Uh, so I have a whole bunch of augmented reality clips in case you want to teach people how to use Erasma. Uh, I have a whole bunch of links to Google documents that talk about can-do statements. So if you want to do can-do statements with your different groups, we have a whole bunch of lists of them right there. Uh, so you can just see now where this becomes a great resource to be able to share all these kind of things. Let me show you another one. Uh, this is a wall I created because the other part of my world is to do training for professionals who will work abroad or would work from people from abroad. And so the whole idea of intercultural communication and how to deal with people is a good hunk of my world in the business school. And so what have I done? I've created a list here of First off, we have models and theories for intercultural communication. So we have David Victor's Les Kant model, Topinar's and Hamlet Turner's Dilemma Theory, Hofstede's Cultural Dimensions. Um, this sends you to my Pathbright homepage. We have uh, Mitchell Hammer's Intercultural Development Inventory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All these different cultural theories that go out there. Then we have a section on tests and surveys that you can take. They're always kind of those, you know, what kind of person are you? personality tests and all those kind of things, they're already there for us to do. Um, we also have here, if I have students do certain assignments, here's a way to do it. And so we have uh, all those. And then over here we have all of these resources that go to cultural things. So these are links to the English proficiency index of other countries, uh, genie statistics for other countries, happiness index by country, world values surveys, all those kind of things that come into our discussions about these cultural issues are here along the way as well. And now they're all there for me. And so every time I have to go back to something related to training, uh, here I have a bunch of U.S. companies that uh, specifically market to the Hispanic audience what is marketing like for that kind of thing. All this to say that I thought the best way to present today's idea was to say, just do what the rest of the world does. We can take a language twist on it, even if that's not what it was meant for initially, and it'll give students the autonomy to do things they couldn't do otherwise. And with that, let's turn it over to you for questions. You have an example that someone that has used this technology and used this concept for a language class, specifically. Yes. Um, I can even show you. 
Ah, I just erased it a couple of weeks ago. I had one. I had an advanced grammar and composition class. And, and it was the same sort of idea, though, where we are now choosing songs related to the grammar principles, or their writing, uh, their writing is, is tied into that, or they get to do their own search on grammar issues. So, and, and by the way, this was fascinating because I did this once with a Spanish class. Who are the Spanish speakers here? I, I once asked students to choose a grammar principle that they're still struggling with and go and figure out stuff on it. And I had one student who was going to study the verb ser. Mm -hmm. And I kind of went, really? <laughs> Here we are, 10 <laughs> semesters into this class, and you want to study the verb to be. OK. But what did she come back with? She came back with samples of the verb ser. And they were awesome sentences like, aquí se habla español. And I'm going, what? <laughs> Aquí se dice la verdad. <laughs> well, it turns out, as a heritage speaker who had never studied Spanish a day in her life, the word se kind of looks like the verb to be. You just drop the R off of it. And so, Aquí se habla, here Spanish is spoken. That sounds like the verb to be. Aquí se dice, here it is said. And at first I went, are you kidding? But then I went, oh, wow. wow. <laughs> I mean, to think that she had enough creativity in her brain, and the poor person had never studied all of this academic sort of stuff, and she's now trying to put all the pieces together with this incredible disadvantage, and she's now trying for the first time in her life to figure out the verb to be, and she thinks that the pronominal verbs are forms of the verb to be, that was pretty cool, you know? And, and, and it gave me a sensitivity to what heritage speakers are going through when they uh, get thrown into a foreign language class. That was pretty awesome. So those would be the kind of examples that I would get when I've given the students the freedom to go search for these sort of things on their own. So hopefully that, that answers your question. Maybe, uh, they can post culturally things that they found interesting or places that they like. I mean, this for more basic mm -hmm. levels. You know, they can share it with the rest of the class. I, I can't resist the temptation to show you from yesterday's class. Um, so our, our visitors from Iraq, uh, three of them are doing a culture class with me. And their assignment is to post photographs of things they have noticed here in Austin, Texas that are culturally distinct from what they're used to in uh, and so here's I'll just this full screen here. So imagine being from Iraq, driving down the street, and there is a truck the size of a train on the side of the freeway, going along the freeway, and he looks at the driver of the truck, and it's this blonde lady. Right? And he's going, and he said to me, before I left on this trip, I needed to teach my wife how to drive and help her get her driver's license because I wasn't going to be there for 10 weeks to help get her around. And she's all nervous about driving, and what happens? I come here, and there's a truck the size of a train <laughs> with some blonde lady driving the truck. That is a picture I would have never thought of as being interesting. But I think it's so interesting that he caught on to that as, as something that was on here. Let me give you just another, another quick example here. And, and I love their courage, too. These are a number of elderly ladies who are celebrating somebody's birthday. I think this was also, was this in San Antonio? I don't know. Yeah. They have the courage to stop these ladies in the street and to say, excuse me, I am visiting from Iraq, and I've noticed you all are having a great time at a birthday party, and you have kind of cute little things on your heads. What in the heck is going on? May I take your picture? You know? And then I find out 
the, the gen this is a new information for me, that a generation ago in Iraq, a lot of people didn't know when their birthday actually was. And so they just randomly designate their birthday as July 1st. July 1st. July 1st. And so there are hundreds and hundreds of people who... What is it? 7% of the old... 7%? Yeah, there are... 7% of the elderly. 70%. 70 of the elderly population has a birthday on July 1st. <laughs> Furthermore, the idea of celebrating it is already a little bit different, and celebrating it on the street in front of the whole world is also different. And so the second we have students doing that kind of stuff, we are just exploding with cool things we can do along the way. You can also apply it to, I see it applied to whatever we're doing. Let's say, identify what people are doing. You know, take pictures of people and tell us what they're doing right now. Or well, you have done exactly what our brains just cannot help but do. And that is the second you look at what we use in society and how does it have an application for classrooms, we just kind of go with ideas that just don't stop flooding because it just keeps coming and coming and coming. So we're doing it right when that's what you start thinking about. Right. All right, we should probably wrap it up because it's almost 2 o'clock. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm taking the first. Thank you. That is too much for our time. Thank you. colleagues as well, because I have uh, the, the joy of giving them a lecture as well a, a, couple, a week ago, I guess, their first lecture when you first arrived here. Uh, and I mentioned the story that Orlando and I have this odd habit of changing the things, it's changing, I should say, the things that we like to do in our classrooms. And literally 10 years ago, I won't say today, but uh, in 2008, we were having one of our, because we, even though we teach so close together in languages that are that our, our, our uh, language departments related to each other, um, we never get to see each other unless we make an appointment to do that. So we were having a coffee together here on campus, and we Orlando, in his tech, techie world, said, so what do you think of this new thing called Twitter? <laughs> Is that 2008? Oh, I said, I think it's kind of dumb. You know, 140 <laughs> characters, what can you really say? And Orlando, always the tech guru, says, actually, 
most of our students' utterances are exactly that way. <laughs> Think about it. Well, you know, you're right. You know, yeah, yeah. And so we really began. I love the way he thought that one of the reasons I would have these meetings is I always love the way Orlando thinks about technology in particular in relationship to what we do in classes. And he says to me, 10 years ago, as a challenge, how could we use this in our classrooms? What could we do with this? And at the time, I was teaching a 300-person course on Russian vampires. It's a way to get students. What can I say? <laughs> we get students that way. So I have this class with 300 vampires in it. And I literally had just begun getting vampires. <laughs> Trust me, they suck everything out of me <laughs> by the end of the course. <laughs> and Orlando says, Go for it. See what you could do with this. What if you tried using it in a course like this? Instead of Q&A, in a typical Q&A with 250, 300 students, how many real questions can you get in 75 minutes? You know, how many students will throw up their hands? No, when you're right, maybe you know, a dozen or so. Let's try this. So in my classroom, I had two screens, one that I put all my material on, a second screen that I put my Twitter feed on. I had never done Twitter in my life. And what I had students do was, live tweet during my lecture and during class. It was astonishing, it really was mind blowing. Students commenting on virtually everything that was put up, asking questions, engaging with each other, it became its own discourse. And very soon after I did that, I threw it over to my language class because Twitter by 2009 had, was able to facilitate Cyrillic, they hadn't quite, uh, Hebrew, they hadn't quite gone to Arabic until 2010. But we watch these Twitter in the classroom grow. And now just about all of our language classes that I'm aware of, that I've observed here at UT, we use Twitter in almost all of our classes in some capacity. We had no idea that this past year, Twitter was going to be weaponized by our president. Uh, <laughs> so we may not be using it that often. But that, this is why I love this guy and I, I, I value our, our And I always felt jealous together. because I had to use Twitter to talk about phonemes and allophones of some fricative. And he gets to do it to talk about vampires. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you anyway. Well, and thank you all for, for sticking it out. Well, this is our kind of our, our, our last breath here. And I get uh, this. I always put myself in this last speaking position, usually trying to say I don't like to ask invited, my invited guests to go last. Because you know people are saying, okay, are we done yet? Can we leave early? What about? Can you validate my parking ticket? All those kind of things. So I say, I'll go last. I'll go last. But it also is actually a big benefit to be last because everything that's been said today, I think, I hope, is rolled up in this. I think this is going to kind of be a, a fun way of pulling all of our talks together. Because I'm going to talk a lot about why the old-fashioned textbook is gone, why cultural interventions of the sort with using technology Orlando's talking about is the thing. And I really am going to tie into what Carl was talking about at the very beginning about really bridging that gap between not just language and culture, creating this sort of language culture or lingua culture, but really how do we move from uh, integration that is language and culture to that third space, lingua culture, where you can't pull the two apart. So that's what I'd like to try to bring together. A little bit of theorizing here, but mostly I'm going to leave the theory on the slides so that you can read it when you want. Uh, uh, Betsy's always great about taking our slides and putting them out uh, on our uh, Texas Language Center website, so you can always refer to them later if you, if you need to. So let me get right into this culture, moving from what we used to do in my, for my generation as culture days to uh, this idea of integrative, transformative instruction in culture. So the then of my life was culture was ancillary to why I was in a language classroom. Mm -hmm. Now I'm talking about the 70s here, but it went well into the 80s, even well after the proficiency guidelines had been printed. I sat in on dozens and dozens of classes. I'm going to tell a secret, and there's no shaming today. <laughs> so if, if I say something, you go, oh God, that's me. <laughs> He's talking about me in my class. It's not to shame me, but rather to say, think about what it is that we may still be doing, because I'm contending a lot of what I'm talking about is then, is still now, too. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to really say, the reason we're here in the 70s is to teach you enough language so you can read the great works of literature. That wasn't hit for, for, my, for Russia. You're learning Russian so you can read, as we used to call it, Tolstoyevsky. 
<laughs> Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, those are the biggies, the big boys of Russian lit. That's why you're learning Russian. If there's any other reason, eh, do that on your own. So the notion that, well, what about culture? What do Russians do? How do they behave? How do they do? Oh, you can't travel there anyway. Don't worry about it. So, there. so it was simply really, really, truly ancillary. And so our two big, uh, as it were, takeaways from any kind of cultural exploitation were what I lovingly call culture days, right? Usually Friday, because we didn't feel like still being in class. The teacher didn't want to plan a separate class for our last day. And so this was the day when let's pop in a video. Right? Or in my generation, let's play a film, right? Let's watch a film, play a game of Scrabble in Russian. These were culture days. Literally, simply isolated is, let's do some folk dancing. Truly. No integration whatsoever with the curriculum. We might have been talking about, I don't know, imperatives and looking at a text on, uh, so remember that this one called, the textbook was called Shurik Vasi Glagol. Uh, Shura, the, the young man, Vasya, his friend, and the verb. <laughs> Try to imagine how inauthentic this text was. <laughs> and, but every Friday, we could be sure there'd be a culture day. A little Russian dancing, music. So we thought, oh yeah, there really are real people in this country called the Soviet Union that we're learning about, but it's all about the verb. That's the more important part. So culture days. And yes, a lot of us do still do these, you know, where you just kind of set the day aside where you talk about the culture or something. And so I'm saying it's not that it's a bad thing, it's just, uh, I'm going to show you the alternative to it in a bit. The other one was culture modules. These were for the progressive teachers. The instructors who had enough foresight to say, actually, culture should be part of our curriculum. Let's work it in as a module with each unit. So when we're doing transfer, uh, let's say we're doing verbs of motion in whatever language we're doing, we'll do a module on transportation. How do Iraqis get around, right? What are modes of transportation? Again, maybe a few videos, maybe a few audio clips, but very, again, modularized. I've got my matroshka dolls here, right? When we get to the verbs of putting and placing, and yes, we do in Russian make the distinction between lay and lie, and I'm proud to say I try still to do this, and on student papers I say, oh, I give up on it, and say, but in case you want to know, it's lay, not lie in this case, and I usually make some now fairly actionable sexual reference of actually lay is only a transitive verb, and I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. And I just, I'm not going to say anymore. So we went to, to verbs of placing when, you know, the matroshka doll, the nesting dolls, one is inside the other, and okay, you get the idea, but it's very, again, modularized. Now I'm not even getting close to the lingua culture conception. I'm really looking at everything we do in language and culture, right? Ver uh, grammar, lexicon, uh, pronunciation, all of that, language, 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 text, 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 culture completely separate, a wall, an, a, an ocean between the two. Indeed, the notion finally, by the 80s, with 